In this video, we'll discuss the heart of the New Deal. FDR was inaugurated on March 4, 1933, and he denounced the money changers who brought on the calamity, and declared that government must wage war on the Great Depression and move decisively by boldly declaring a nationwide banking holiday from March 6 to the 10th and summoning Congress into a special session to cope with the national emergency. In his first hundred days, Congress cranked out unprecedented remedial legislation. These new measures were to deal with the desperate economy and were aimed at the three R's of relief, recovery, and reform. The short-range goals were relief and immediate recovery in two years, and the long-range goals were permanent recovery and reform of current abuses. This shows an unemployed and frustrated person. Read the sign to see what they're frustrated about. This table shows the principal New Deal acts during the first 100 days Congress in 1933. If you pause, you can clearly see legislation passed for recovery, for relief, and for reform. Roosevelt's 100 Days Congress rubber-stamped bills draft by the White House. Roosevelt's must legislation gave him extraordinary blank check powers. Some of the new laws delegated the legislative authority to the chief executive, and he passed many essential New Deal 3 R's through the long-range measures added later. New Dealers embraced the progressive ideas. Unemployment insurance and old age insurance were positive things. Minimum wage regulations were also another aspect. Conservation and development of natural resources and restrictions on child labor, which were all progressive ideals. He invented some new schemes as well with the Tennessee Valley Authority, and no longer would America look as backward in the realm of social welfare as it had once, once FDR was through being president. The banking chaos, in dealing with it, he went into immediate action by passing the Emergency Banking Relief Act of 1933. This invested the president with power to regulate banking transactions and foreign exchange and to reopen solvent banks. In order to communicate these ideas to the American people, Roosevelt turned to the radio and he delivered the first of 30 famous fireside chats with the American people and told them that it was now safe to keep money in the reopened banks. He instilled confidence back in the people and the banks unlocked their doors. This is a picture of the champ FDR chatting with reporters. The Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act was also passed which created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or the FDIC. This insured individual deposits up to $5,000 and it would be later raised. This ended bank failures, dating back to the wildcat days of Andrew Jackson. The declining gold reserves, in order to deal with them, he ordered all private holdings of gold be surrendered to the Treasury in exchange for paper currency, and then he took the nation off the gold standard. Congress canceled the gold payment clause in all of the contracts. This shows bank failures before and after the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act of 1933, and you can clearly see the reduction in bank failures. He also authorized repayment in paper currency. A managed currency was on its way, and FDR's managed currency was inflation, which he believed would relieve the debtor's burdens and stimulate new production. The principal instrument he would use for achieving inflation was the gold buying. He instructed the Treasury to purchase gold at increasing prices. The price of gold increased from $21 an ounce to $35 an ounce, and that price would, help, would hold for four decades. The policy did increase the amount of dollars in circulation. An inflationary result provoked the wrath of the sound money critics on the baloney dollar. But the gold scheme came to an end in February 1934 when Roosevelt returned to limited gold standard for international trade purposes, and the United States pledged to pay all foreign bills if requested in gold at a rate of one ounce of gold for every $35 due. The domestic circulation of gold continued to be prohibited, and gold coins became collector's items. The over, in dealing with the overwhelming unemployment, at this time one out of four workers were jobless. These were the highest levels of unemployment in the nation's history. Roosevelt had no hesitancy about using the federal money to assist the unemployed, and at the same time, priming the pump of industrial recovery. So he created the Civilian Conservation Corps, Corps which was the most popular of the New Deal alphabetical agencies, as they were called. They provided unemployment 
in fresh air government or provided employment, I'm sorry, in fresh air government camps for about three million young men. And they did useful work in court, including reforestation, firefighting, flood control, and swamp drainage. Recruits were required to help their parents by sending home most of their pay, and both human and natural resources were conserved in this way. This is uh, CCC workers in Alaska. There were critics also saying that the minor complaint that minor complaints um, basically that we were militarizing the nation's youth. Now for adult employment, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration under Harry Hopkins was brought into creation. And Hopkins agency granted three billion dollars to states for the direct dole payments or preferably for wages on work projects. The relief for the hard pressed special groups also came about through the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA, which made millions available to help farmers meet their mortgages, or the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which refinanced mortgages on non-farm homes, assisted a million badly pinched households, bailed out mortgage-holding banks, and bolted loyalties of the relieved middle-class homeowners securely to the Democratic Party. The Civil Works Administration also was set up by Roosevelt himself under the direction of Hopkins via the FERA. Basically, he provided temporary jobs during the cruel winter emergency, and tens of thousands of jobless were employed at leaf raking and other make-work tasks. This scheme was widely criticized as the kind of labor that put a premium on shovel-leaning slow motion. These were later major deal measures, that were basically after the first hundred days. Again, recovery, relief, and reform. Persistence of suffering indicated emergency relief measures were still needed. Not only was it to be continued, but supplemented. But the danger signal was the appearance of demagogues, notably magnetic microphone messiahs, one of which was Father Charles Coughlin, who began broadcasting in 1930. His slogan was social justice, and his, new, his anti-New Deal messages went to 40 million radio fans. He was so anti-Semitic, fascistic, and demagogic that he was silenced in 1942 by ecclesiastical superiors. A new brood of agitators capitalized on popular discontent as well. Dr. Francis Townsend promised everyone over sixty two hundred dollars a month. Senator Huey P. Long, who was called the Kingfish, publicized his Share Our Wealth program and promised to make every man a king, saying that every family would receive five thousand dollars, supposedly at the expense of the prosperous. But the fear of Long becoming a fascist dictator ended when he was shot by an assassin in Louisiana in nineteen thirty five. Here's a picture of Huey Long. Demagogues like Coughlin and Long raised troubling questions about the link between fascism and the economic crisis. Authoritarian rule was strengthened in Japan. Adolf Hitler during this time period was acquiring absolute authority in Germany, and some worried that Roosevelt would turn into a dictator as well. So to quiet the unrest, Congress authorized the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA. This objective was employment on useful projects. The agency ultimately spent about $11 million, billion dollars on thousands of public buildings, bridges, and hard surface roads. Not every WPA project strengthened the infrastructure, though. One controlled crickets in Wyoming, and one built a monkey pen in Oklahoma City. But this was uh, one of the most popular programs, and it was one of the most and it also had one of the most w loved WPA programs, which was the Federal Art Project, which hired artists to create posters and murals in the inner cities. This is a picture of pub a public art mural by Victor Aronoff on a wall of Coit Tower in San Francisco. Critics claimed that WPA meant we provide alms. Over eight years, nearly nine million people were given jobs, not handouts. It nourished precious talent, it preserved the self-respect of the people, and fostered the creation of more than a million pieces of art, many of them publicly displayed. So there was also a new visibility of women during this time period, and after the 19th Amendment, women began to carve more space in a political and intellectual life. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was the most visible woman in the White House, and the Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, was also visible as the first woman cabinet member. Mary McLeod Bethune was also 
the director of the Office of Minority Affairs in national in the National Youth Administration, and she served as the highest ranking African American in the Roosevelt administration. This is a picture of Frances Perkins at the site of the Golden Gate Bridge project. The women's contributions in the social sciences continued as well. In anthropology, Ruth Benedict carried on the work of her mentor, Franz Boas, by developing the culture and personality movement in the 1930s and 1940s. Benedict's landmark work was Pattern of Culture, which established a study of cultures as collective personalities and that each culture, like each individual, had its own more or less consistent pattern of thought and action. Margaret Mead was a student of Benedict, and her studies of adolescence among Pacific Island peoples advanced bold new ideas about sexuality, gender roles, and intergenerational relationships. She published 34 books and had a curatorship at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. She popularized cultural anthropology and achieved celebrity status rare among social scientists. Pearl Buck also introduced American readers to Chinese peasant society in her best-selling novel, The Good Earth, and earned the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1938. She used her fame to advance humanitarian causes. Industry and labor was helped during this time period as well, and the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA, was created. This was the most complex and far-reaching of the New Deal projects. This combined immediate relief with long-range recovery and reform. It was triple-barreled, designed to assist industry, labor, and the unemployed. Individual industries would work out codes of fair competition under which hours of labor would re be reduced. This was to spread employment to more people. A ceiling was placed on the maximum hours of labor and a floor was placed under wages to establish minimum levels. This is a picture of Mary McLeod Bethune, who was the director of the Office of Minority Affairs in the National Youth Administration. Labor was also granted additional benefits. Workers were formally guaranteed the right to organize and bargain collectively through their representatives of their own choosing, not agents of the company's choosing. The yellow dog, or anti-union contract, was expressly forbidden, and certain restrictions were placed on the use of child labor. The NRA's fair competition codes called for self-denial by the management and labor. It also aroused patriotism by mass meetings and parades. The Blue Eagle was designed as a symbol as the N of the NRA, and for a brief time, there was an upswing in business activity. But there were also problems of the NRA. There was too much self-sacrifice expected of labor, industry, and the public. The age of chiselry, as unscrupulous businessmen, displayed the Blue Eagle, but secretly violated the codes. Supreme Court killed the NRA in the famed Sick Chicken case, in the Schechter court, in the Schechter case, the court ruled that Congress could not delegate legislative powers to the executive and declared that only congressional control of interstate commerce could not apply to a local business. The Public Works Administration, or the PWA, like the NRA, was intended for industrial recovery and unemployment relief, and it was headed by Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes. $4 billion was spent on 34,000 projects, such as public buildings, highways, and parkways. The Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River was a famous part of this program. It irrigated millions of acres of new farmland and created more electrical power than the entire Tennessee Valley Authority, and it transformed the Pacific Northwest with abundant water and power. The liquor industry during this time period was realizing that the repeal of prohibition was imminent, and this afforded an opportunity to raise federal revenues and to provide employment. So the 100 Days Congress legalized light wine and beer with alcoholic content of no more than 3.2% by weight, and they levied a tax of $5 on every barrel that was manufactured. So prohibition was repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933, and the saloon doors swung open. This is a picture of the Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River in Washington State. Suffering farmers since the war boom days of 1918 were continuing to suffer low prices and overproduction, and then as a result of the Depression, innumerable mortgages were foreclosed. So to help the farmers, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration was created. Through artificial scarcity, they planned to establish parity prices for basic commodities. 
parity as a price set for a product that gave it the same value in purchasing power that it had enjoyed from 1909 to 1914. The AAA would eliminate price-depressing surpluses by paying growers to reduce their crop acreages. Millions raised were raised by taxing processors of farm products, who in turn would then shift the burden to consumers. This subsidized scarcity would raise farm income. Paying workers not to farm increased unemployment. But the Supreme Court killed the act in 1936, and Congress hastened to pass the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936 as well, where farmers were paid to plant soil-conserving crops or to let the land lie fallow. The emphasis was on conservation, approved by the Supreme Court. In the second Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938, there were continued conservation payments. If the growers observed the acreage restrictions on specified commodities, they would be eligible for the parity payments. The goal was to give farmers not only a fairer price, but a more substantial share of the national income, and this was partially achieved. Dust bowls and black blizzards hit also during the Great Depression, so nature helped to provide unplanned scarcity. The Dust Bowl was caused by a drought and wind that triggered dust storms, but they were not the only culprits. Farmers had bought countless acres of marginal land under cultivation, and dry farming techniques and mechanization had revolutionized the Great Plains agriculture. These methods left powdery topsoil to be swept away at nature's whim. Tens of thousands of refugees fled ruined farms as a result, and many settled in the San Joaquin Valley of California. Yet the transition was cruel. This was a dismal story told of these human tumbleweeds was realistically portrayed by John Steinbeck in his book, The Grapes of Wrath. There were efforts to relieve their burdens, though. The Fraser lemke Farm Bankruptcy Act in 1934 was passed, which made possible the suspension of mortgage foreclosures for five years, which was voided the next year by the Supreme Court. This revised law, limiting grace period to three years, was unanimously upheld. This is an Oakey family hitting the road in the 1930s to escape the Dust Bowl. The Resettlement Administration was also created in 1935 and charged with removing near farmless farmers to better land. So 200 million young trees were successfully planted on bare prairies by young men of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Native Americans felt the far-reaching hand of the New Deal reform as well. When the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier, sought to reverse the forced assimilation policies in place since the Dawes Act, and he promoted the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which was the Indian New Deal, encouraging tribes to establish local self-government and preserve Native crafts and traditions. This new law helped to stop the loss of Indian lands and revived the tribe's interest in identity and culture, but not all Native Americans applauded it. Some denounced it as the back-to-the-blanket measure that would make museum pieces out of Indians, and 77 tribes refused to organize under it, though nearly 200 others did establish tribal governments. This map shows the extent of the erosion in the 1930s. The New Dealers also were determined to reform the money changers, who were the bankers and big business. These were who had played fast and loose with the gullible investors before the Wall Street crash of 1929. So the Truth and Securities Act, which is called the Federal Securities Act, was passed, which required promoters to transmit to investors sworn information regarding the soundness of stocks and bonds. And the Securities and Exchange Commission was created in 1934, which was a watchdog agency to protect the public against the fraud, deception, and inside manipulation. Stock markets would operate more as trading marts and less as gambling casinos. New dealers directed their fire at public utility holding companies as well, and one such super corporation collapsed in 1932 when Samuel Insull's financial empire crashed. The Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935 was passed, which was a death sentence to such bloated growth except where it might be deemed economically needful. The Tennessee Valley Authority harnessed the Tennessee River. Electric power industry had attracted the ire of the New Deal reformers for charging excessive rates in an industry that reached directly into the pocketbooks of millions of customers for vitally needed services. So the Tennessee River 
had provided the new dealers with an opportunity. By developing hydroelectric potential of the entire area, Washington could combine an immediate advantage. They could give employment to thousands of people to work and long-term project for reforming the power monopoly. So the Tennessee Valley Authority was born in 1933, which is the vision of Senator George Norris of Nebraska. And from the standpoint of the planned economy, which was by far the most revolutionary of the all New Deal schemes, he was determined to discover precisely how much it costs to produce and to distribute electricity. And with that yardstick, the fairness of rates would be charged by private companies, and you could judge them on that. So the New Dealers pointed with pride to the amazing achievements of the Tennessee Valley Authority. This shows the Tennessee Valley, uh, the TVA area, where more than 20 dams were constructed on the river as part of the massive project to control flooding, generate hydroelectric power, and revitalize the region, while creating jobs for the unemployed. The benefits to the area, it created full employment, cheap electric power, low-cost housing, abundant cheap nitrates, the restoration of eroded soil, reforestation, improved navigation, and flood control. New dealers agitated for parallel enterprises in the valleys of the Columbia, the Colorado, and the Missouri rivers. The conservative reaction against the socialistic New Deal confined the Tennessee Valley Authority's brand of federally guided resource management and comprehensive regional development to Tennessee Valley, so it was not expanded to those other areas. This is occupied households with electric service in figure 32.2. You can pause, look at the graph, and read. The New Deal housing policies also included the Federal Housing Administration in 1934, which was the building industry stimulated by small loans to householders used to improve their dwellings and to complete new ones. This was so popular it outlasted the age of Roosevelt, and Congress bolstered the program in 1937 by authorizing the United States Housing Authority. This agency was designed to lend money to states or communities for low-cost construction, so 650,000 units were started, but it was tragically short of the needs. This also collided with opposition from real estate promoters, builders, landlords, and anti-New Dealers, so still slum areas ceased to grow, and they also shrank. The Social Security Act of 1935 was also passed, making unemployment insurance and old age pensions a reality. And one of the most, this was one of the most complicated and far-reaching laws ever to pass the Congress. This provided for federal state unemployment insurance to cushion future depressions, provided for security for old age, specified the categories of retired workers who would receive regular payments from Washington. These payments ranged from $10 to $85 a month, and they were financed by a payroll tax on employers and employees. So the provisions were also made for the blind, physically handicapped, delinquent children, and other dependents. Republican opposition was bitter. Social Security must be built upon a cult of work, not a cult of leisure, insisted Hoover. And the GOP national chairman falsely charged that every worker would have to wear a metal dog tag for life. Social Security was inspired by industrial nations of Europe. In the urbanized economy, governments were now recognizing its responsibility for the welfare of citizens. And by 1939, only over 45 million were el eligible for Social Security benefits. In the future, other categories were added. Farm and domestic workers, which were millions of poor men and women who were initially excluded. And in contrast to Europe, where welfare programs were universal, the American workers had to be employed and in certain jobs to get coverage. A, there was also a new deal for labor, and the Wagner Act was passed. The National Labor Relations Act was a part of that, which was named after the sponsor, Senator Robert Wagner. This created a powerful new labor relations board. For administrative purposes, they reasserted the right of labor to engage in self-organization, to collectively bargain through the representatives of their own choice, and this was actually considered the Magna Carta of labor. The Wagner Act proved to be a major milestone for American workers. Under sympathetic National Labor Relations Boards, the unskilled workers began to organize into effective unions. The leader was John L. Lewis, who was the boss of the United Mine Workers. He formed the Committee for the Industrial Organization, which is the CIO, and the American Federation of Labor, which is the AFL, or actually within the AFL. So in 1936, the AFL suspended the CIO, and the CIO then moved into the auto industry, 
they resorted to sit-down strikes, refused to leave the factory building of General Motors at Flint, Michigan, and thus prevented the importance of strike, importation of strike breakers. This is a picture of the General Motors sit-down strikers in Flint, Michigan, 1937. Conservative respecters of private property were scandalized, and this was a victory when General Motors recognized the CIO as the sole bargaining agency for its employees. Unskilled workers pressed their advantage. U.S. Steel Company averted a strike when it granted rights of unionization to its CIO organized employees. Little Steel Companies fought back savagely, but in 1937, the Memorial Day Massacre at Republic Steel Company plant in Chicago happened, South Chicago, and afterward, the police opened fire. The area was strewn with several score of dead and wounded. The Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in 1938, also known as the Wages and Hours Bill, which set minimum wages and maximum hours for industries involved in interstate commerce. The goal was 40 cents an hour, which was later raised, and 40 hours a week. So labor by children under 16 was forbidden, and reforms were bitterly opposed by industrialists, especially textiles. They excluded the agricultural service and domestic workers, which meant many blacks, Mexican-Americans, and women did not benefit from this act. This is a picture called Labor Triumphant. Labor unionized, unionization thrived, and the president received valuable support at the ballot box from labor leaders and appreciative workers. The Committee for Industrialized Organization formally reconstituted as the Congress of Industrial Organization, which was the new CIO under John L. Lewis, and by 1940 they claimed membership of about 4 million, including 200,000 blacks, and the jurisdictional feuding continued with the AFL, and labor seemed to be more bent on costly civil war than on war with the management. This shows labor union men, uh, membership in selected countries, 1913 to 2012. Landon challenged the champ. So in the upcoming election of 1936, the Democrats renominated Roosevelt on the platform squarely endorsing the New Deal. The Republicans were hard-pressed to find a candidate, so they settled on Alfred Landon. Landon was a moderate who accepted some New Deal reforms but was not popular um, and not happy about the Social Security Act. So the Republicans condemned the New Deal of Franklin Deficit Roosevelt for its radicalism, experimentation, confusion, and frightful waste. Landon was backed by Hoover, called, who called for the Holy Crusade for Liberty and the American Liberty League of Wealthy Conservatives. Roosevelt denounced the economic royalists. In the election returns, the landslide overwhelmed Landon, who only won two states, Maine and Vermont. So Roosevelt clearly won the popular vote and the electoral vote, 523 to 8, and the Democrats now claimed more than two-thirds of the seats in the House and the same proportion in the Senate. In the Battle of 1936, was, this was the most bitter since Bryan's defeat in 1896. Partially, this bore out the Republican charges of class warfare, and needy economic groups lined up against so-called greedy economic groups. The CIO contributed generously to FDR's campaign, and many left-wingers turned to Roosevelt as the third-party protest, protest vote declined sharply, and blacks switched to the Democratic Party. Roosevelt won because he appealed to the forgotten man whom he never forgot, and some supporters only were pocketbook deep. They were called reliefers. Roosevelt forged powerful and enduring coalitions of Southerners, blacks, urbanites, and poor. He marshaled the support of the new immigrants, mostly Catholics and Jews, who had come of age politically, and in the 1920s, one out of every 25 federal judgeships went to a Catholic. Roosevelt appointed Catholics to one out of every four.